Hello everyone, Kundan here, and I welcome you all for the new guest lecture series where we have uh, one of the learner from the complete course of Indian stock market, person much more senior than me in age, experience, and everything. And I'm thankful that he accepted, agreed upon to share his knowledge, his experience, and uh, you know you you will get to know what he's going to share in another one hour presentation so you all know what is the format of this uh, series well before i introduce mr rajesh let me tell you one small thing here and it is about economics so you all people have taken that lecture of economics from me in my course a complete course on indian stock market so what economics say that it's one field which study about production, consumption, and transfer of wealth. In a stock market course, it is very important that you all understand economics. And that's why I have included that in the chapter. Well, at this point of time, when everybody is under lockdown, what kind of wealth transfer which we can have? So at this point of time, I know it's uh, very difficult to quantify few things in numbers, in money. I can quantify that this cup may cost 100 rupees and coffee inside this cup may cost 30 rupees. However, when it comes to knowledge, it comes to trust within the society and the confidence level of people to make a nation great, it will become very difficult to quantify that, right? However, it has a very, very larger impact. At this difficult time when everybody is quarantined, the one wealth which we can transfer to each other is our knowledge. We all go through educational process of getting degree, going to the college, but the kind of experience which you get after working in different sectors is something which I would rate higher than any formal education. And that's the reason I have started this series where one of the learner come forward and share his experience and justify the economics of time, the time which we have right now, the free time. So I would hand over to Mr. Rajesh before giving a small introduction about himself that he's an electrical engineer, a graduate with over 25 years of experience in electrical and automation. From last five years, he's an independent consultant in oil and gas exploration field. He has been taking assignments on both land and offshore rigs in India, Australia, Southeast Asia, Middle East, Africa, and America. Well, guys, I remember a very small incident when in this Facebook group, someone asked how they can use Google Sheet as one tool to track their mutual fund investments. I taught you to use Google Sheet and write those finance function to track the live numbers of the stock market. But then someone was also looking for how to do it for the mutual fund. And then Mr. Rajesh have answered it and helped some other learner. And then one day he messaged me that he want to speak. We spoke at length and I thought, apart from the experience which he's having as a techno commercial person in oil and gas, he have a very rich experience also in starting up businesses. In his own words, he told me that day, sorry, sir, without your permission, I'm sharing our one-to-one -one talk. That, Most welcome, sir. <laughs> that uh, Kundan, I have become a consultant. Otherwise, I was a born businessman. I always wanted to do business. And all I can tell to Mr. Rajesh that, it, I mean, this is the probably best time to start a business, okay, in India. This is the right time when we have to generate a lot of trust and people like you come forward and again become businessmen, again become change maker and inspire a lot of young generation to do business. At this point of time, businesses are very important. In today's one of the live doubt lecture, I was telling that the way I grew up, I saw Hindi movies. And in most of the Hindi movies, I saw that a businessman has been always pitched as a villain. So be it, be it a arena from the you know, villages or the city, businessmen would never be shown as a hero of the society. And I grew up uh, under my father, a mathematician, uh, who, who was having a lot of influence 
from non capitalist side but but you know we both transformed not only me he also transformed when i came to bits pilani i learned i saw the world interacted with other people and then a person from village he comes forward start living in the city having a better life these are all the end product of capitalism right so we have started this course we talk a lot about money we talk a lot about investments but the real money real investment is the knowledge which we possess then only the learning curve can go really high so guys bear with me for another one one and a half hour and hear from mr rajesh ask all your difficult questions whichever you have and learn about oil and gas industry and apart from that learn from his experience also i'm really sorry for taking this much of time mr rajesh to introduce yourself over to you now thank you thank thank you very much uh, mr kundan that was a very flowery uh, introduction of me uh, and compared to my experience my educational qualification pales in comparison to yours uh, i did my graduation from mbj college of engineering in bangalore compared to bits pilani worlds apart so experience and qualifications are diametrically opposite um uh, well it's been a long journey uh, close to 30 years since my uh, graduation and life has uh, been good i would say i wouldn't say tough it has been good and uh, i'm now ready for the presentations without uh, much uh, delay great sir i'll share your presentation sorry should i be on the screen yes your presentation is visible sir okay this is uh, the presentation on dynamics of offshore drilling before i start i just want to give a brief disclaimer this presentation is for the purpose of understanding in layman's terms of the various aspects of the offshore drilling industry the presenter does not claim to be an authority in this industry and the information presented here are just his observations and knowledge gained during his interactions in this field and from data available in the public domain the presenter also wishes to place on record the extensive use of open source information like google wikipedia and yahoo finance in compiling this presentation on a personal note i would like to a uh, draw inspiration from a dialogue from a southern superstar mr rajnikant what i know fits into my hand what i don't know is the size of the universe in tamil he would say that as arinjad kaiyalavu ariyadadu ulagalavu so that is my doctrine of life what i know is limited what i don't know is tremendous So without much ado i would like to step into the presentation uh the oil and exploration field can be broadly classified into two segments the land drilling or the onshore drilling uh which uh, constitutes about 70% of the worldwide uh, oil production and uh, the offshore or ocean drilling the balance 30% i would like to take a pause here you might wonder if land drill based drilling constitute 70% why am i emphasizing so much on the uh, balance 30% why is this presentation uh, more focused on the uh, offshore drilling for the simple reason that offshore drilling has lot more challenges compared to the land drilling i am not so, taking away anything away from the land drilling but the offshore drilling brings with it huge challenges which are to a certain extent not existent in a land based drilling what the challenges uh, yeah. mr mr rajesh i'm really sorry to interrupt you but i can see comment from the people and some are saying little louder please so maybe uh, you can have the mic uh, near to you or okay okay yeah. i'm sorry yeah so i'm sorry i mean I, i can hear you very clearly but some people might have device which don't have uh, which are like you know not able to increase the volume so probably we can be louder okay sure sure, sure guys uh, it will be fine yeah. now 
Okay, so the focus is on offshore drilling for the simple reason that uh, the challenges that exist in an offshore drilling are a lot more compared to what challenges present in the onshore drilling. What these challenges are, we would uh, see them as we proceed in this presentation. Before I uh, step into the actual presentation, I would be referring to any uh, ocean-going vessel as a she. There are a lot of folklores uh, uh, behind this as to why an uh, ocean-going vessel is called a she and not an it and an inanimate uh, thing. The one that I like the best is love her, take good care of her, and she'll take good care of you. Uh, there are many more. You could pick and choose what you would like to uh, associate uh, with, but this is my personal favorite. Uh, the offshore drilling uh, can be uh, segmented into uh, different uh, categories. The word MODU here stands for Mobile Offshore Drilling Units. They are classified based on the uh, water depths and drilling depths that they are capable of. Starting from uh, the uh, swamp barge, which operated about 5 to 50 meters of drilling depth, uh, water depth, sorry, and a drilling depth of a maximum of 6,000 meters. A jackup rig with 25 to 150 meters of uh, water table and about 9,000 meters of uh, drilling depth with a possible additional 4,000 meters of uh, horizontal drilling or directional drilling. The next segment would be the semi-subs, which operate in about 500 to 3,000 meters of water table and a drilling depth of about 10,000 meters. And the final, the deep water, which we call the which is segmented for the drill ships, operate at about uh, three, uh, 500 to 3,650 meters of water table and a total drilling depth of uh, in excess of 12,000 meters. What, how these individual segments line up, we would look in the ongoing segments. This is the aerial view of a swamp batch. This uh, is actually taken from a location in uh, Nigeria, which I happen to be to. Uh, this actually is an artificially created pool of water. There is actually a river, small stream of uh, river flowing here. From there, uh, this clear area has been cleared of vegetation and this artificial pool created. And the uh, rig glides into the section and starts drilling operations. The quest for uh, hydrocarbons has taken man to innumerable uh, locations and I would consider this as one tough location to uh, drill for the simple reason that as the dust sets in, in in the evening you would be swamped with insects mosquitoes every possible thing and you would have to continue working in that uh, extreme environment it is difficult I've been there it's one of the most toughest uh, situations to be, to work with all those insects coming and uh, taking a uh, free ride on your body. The next uh, would be the jackup rigs. This uh, is a picture of a shell trailing rig, Kratong, in uh, presently drilling in the Gulf of Thailand. I had the pleasure of being on this uh, rig too. Kratong is the name of a festival in Thailand uh, commemorating with uh, the 12th lunar uh, full moon day. And it is a festival for uh, uh, praying uh, for the god river goddess. And they actually pray for the river goddess Ganga, which actually flows in India. So somewhere they have a connection with our Indian culture too. This wreck uh, was actually built in uh, in the UAE and was transported to the location in, uh, in Thailand with the help of this heavy lift uh, ship. And uh, once on location, these legs jacked down right up to the ocean floor. And once the uh, legs have penetrated the ocean floor, this uh, part of the rig that's called the hull, then jacks up above the water and to be aligned with this platform to start the drilling operations from here, where this equipment called the derrick would actually glide out 
and the drilling would commence. These are a bit technical, but you can, I'm, try, I'm trying to be as layman as possible so that most of the uh, people in the course of my fellow students in this course, being from the financial or the IT sector, would be able to comprehend better. But if I am going too fast or if something is uh, a bit difficult to comprehend, Kundan, I would request you to just uh, pull me back or uh, ask your questions uh, intermittently. I'm, I'm ready to stop, pause, and uh, answer those questions so, too. So I completely understand, sir. Sir, you know, uh, we have been taught everything in schools. We have been taught Sanskrit. We have been taught history. And we have been taught so many other courses in our engineering that at yeah. certain point of time, I used to think that why we have been even taught. But now when I look back, I see that everything had a reason. Everything which we have learned make us a complete man. You know, exactly. and so I know what you are explaining is technical, but it is interesting. It may not directly, you know, immediately benefit anyone and we are not doing it for the benefits indirect direct benefits but what i can tell you that i am understanding and i don't see anyone complaining that they are not able to understand it you are understanding that what are the different levels at which we find crude and what are yeah. the different type of rigs which you use to drill that yeah. and yeah. you have shown it in pictures and yeah. i love it at least i got to know the very first time how rig look like exactly Honestly. Okay. Exactly. So, exactly. So, yeah. So understanding given this part that, uh, you know, the life is very difficult of people who are working there is again a learning for me, you know. So yeah. please continue. Please continue. And I don't see, I, I see some commercial questions like uh, why, uh, you know, what is the costing of uh, crude extraction in India through ONG, for ONGC. So that kind of commercial questions which may directly help them relate with, you know, analyze probably ONGC share is coming. But I would suggest that you continue. Yeah, I've, I've, and got some, I've got some figures coming up later. I know this is going to be addressed to an audience of uh, uh, accountants and um, uh, people in the finance industry. So I've got some numbers coming at the end of the presentation. So we, right. uh, we, would, cover, we would cover that. And the right. reason why the, another point that I would like to make is uh, you know, when uh, Facebook purchased shares in uh, Geo, you would have seen uh, numerous news channels talking of uh, data, the new oil, right? So right. what uh, exactly? So if data is going to be the uh, driving force of the global economy, that means they are acknowledging that uh, the oil has been the driving force of the global economy all these uh, for, for over a century now. In which case, it is uh, essential for us to understand what this uh, uh, oil industry has done to the global economy, how this economy works uh, in a way. Uh, it's it's an uh, eye-opener, I would say, for the young students uh, uh, who are part of this course here. Great. Great, sir. So please continue with this presentation. Don't worry about, you know, whether it's getting technical or not. We are certainly learning from your uh, beautiful presentation. Yeah, thank you. I'll try to keep it as simple and as engaging as possible. The, uh, so if this is a up close in the personal view of the uh, leg, if you see this is the hull of the rig, and through that, the leg is actually going down deep into the uh, ocean floor. And this is a pictorial representation. This is the LO platform that you see here. And this is the three rigs of the rig that have been embedded into the ocean floor. Now, one of the reasons why I say uh, drilling in the, uh, in the ocean is difficult compared to uh, the land. If, imagine if this were to be floating in the water, and if, they, if you're trying to drill from this section, this incidentally is called the derrick of the rig. And if you were trying to drill from here, because of the uh, pitch and roll that the water, uh, that the ocean would have on the uh, vessel here, your drill bit would never be in its locked in position in the uh, well center. It would be just all over the place. 
So to get that stability and to ensure that the ocean uh, does not have an effect on the rig, this kind of a setup for the shallow water drilling has been devised. This is not a new technology. To my knowledge, it has been there for over 50 years now. And where uh, I would say it is an ingenious way to uh, uh, you know, design this, where the legs actually go deep into the ocean floor, make it sturdy, pull, uh, jack yourself up, and then you are now completely eliminating the possibility of any pitch and roll that this uh, ocean would be creating on this vessel. Yes, in case of an extreme uh, weather condition where the wind uh, speeds are pretty high and the ocean sea state is rough, you would have uh, a certain amount of uh, vibration on the rig, but not to the extent that which would cause a hampering of the operations. So that is the uh, benefit of this uh, scheme of uh, designing a rig. Up next is uh, a semi-submersible. Uh, this is uh, from a company called Ensco, uh, which has now metamorphosed because of mergers and acquisitions into a company called Velaris. We would touch upon it a little later. Uh, this is a rig called Ensco 5006. Uh, and she was on contract in Australia for over uh, five years, from 2014 till until 2019. Presently, unfortunately, uh, she has been retired from services and uh, ready for a scrapyard. It, it tears my heart out because I had spent some memorable time on this rig and wonderful team, wonderful uh, set of crew to work with. I've solved some really critical uh, 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 drilling uh, issues that cropped up. Uh, emotions apart, this rig would have four, uh, sorry, eight anchors spread all across the four corners. This yellow section here is one of the anchors, which is presently not deployed. Th this rope that you see here is carrying the, is scaling the weight of the uh, other anchor on this leg. There is one anchor going here, and you would have two other anchors on the other side of the rig. So once on location, the eight anchors are deployed and the rig is tightened up. This section called the pontoons are actually uh, preloaded with uh, the seawater. And as the weight of the rig increases, they start to slowly go into the uh, ocean and up to this water line, this black, we call it the water line. So essentially, the rig then submerges partially in water. And then the stability of the rig is perfectly ensured. I have spent, as I said earlier, spent many uh, days and nights here. I have never seen, uh, I never felt that actually I was in the middle of an ocean. Only when I came out and had a 360 degree view, would I see that there's only water all around. But otherwise, I would never get the feeling that I was actually on a, a vessel, which is in the, right in the middle of the ocean. The stability is that uh, as good as uh, in land. Then uh, the only disadvantage of this rig or, and as well as the, the uh, jack-up rigs are they are not self-mobile. So if they have to finish a well here and start another well a, a few nautical miles away, then these rigs would need the support of tugboats to tow them to the new location. But in case of a long uh, travel across oceans, as I said earlier, from, say, uh, the Middle East, from uh, the UAE into uh, uh, this place, uh, Gulf of Thailand, they would use that heavy lift. But for short hauls, it would be with the help of a tugboat. So this disadvantage was subsequently overcome with the help of uh, a DP vessel, or otherwise called the dynamically positioned vessel. Now, this vessel, this presently is drilling in the Gulf of Mexico. And I also happen to be on this vessel. Uh, in the middle of 2018, yeah, in mid of 2018, an amazing uh, vessel, unique in design, circular. It has got thrusters underneath the uh, hull. When I talk of thrusters, it is nothing but a pro kind of a propeller, if I were to use a uh, layman's term, which can allow the ship to navigate between uh, uh, two places. 
but again it is again, for short distances between say two well uh, it can move but if we were to travel for over a longer distance those thrusters can take it but because of the construction in terms of a circular construction the water resistance would be so high that the speeds that these uh, vessels can achieve maximum speed would be so slow that uh, moving across oceans would be a very time consuming uh, task so they would then use the uh, heavy lift uh, uh, like the one i showed it for the jackup and move it across oceans uh the, the the dp for the uh, purpose of this dp vessel is with the help of a gps coordinate it can lock itself to that coordinate and ensure that no ocean current can move the ship away from that specified uh, locked in coordinates to a degree of about i would say uh, five uh, or maximum 10 mm Uh, distance. That's the accuracy that the GPS coordinates can uh, achieve. Uh, pretty high when you consider that the size of the ocean to the size of the rig is too small, and uh, 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 the ocean currents could be exerting such a tremendous force. But the thrusters are so strong that they can overcome the uh, ocean currents and lock themselves in position and hold themselves firm. so that when the drilling happens from this location from the derrick it's all uh, nice and clean the last segment uh, is the deep water uh, this is a drill ship it's named after our indian legendary uh, industrialist dhirubhai uh, i'm not sure how this name was given to the ship it is this ship uh, this drill ship belongs to a company called transocean transocean is a swedish company and how they decided to uh, name against an indian entrepreneur i have no clues i tried to google while i was uh, picking up this photograph but unfortunately i couldn't get the authentic information on that uh, there are actually two ships called uh, dhirubhai deepwater kg1 and dhirubhai deepwater kg2 the picture here is of kg2 kg1 is presently drilling to my knowledge in the east coast in uh, the bay of bengal KG2 is is on its way presently from Singapore to uh, Australia to drill in Australian waters. From the construction, you will see that it is no different from the ocean-going ships that you would have already seen in the past. The only difference is that this has got a huge structure, which is the derrick, as I said earlier, and an additional uh, heli deck over here for uh, transfer of people. now the unique thing of these three uh, rigs is uh, the both the dp uh, mood as well as uh, the uh, dp vessel and the uh, drill ship is it's got a huge hole right at the center over here uh, for this it would be in the center uh, uh, at this section here and for the for this rig it will be over here that hole is in uh, the oil parlance it is called the moon pool the moon pool is actually the beehive of activity for the entire drilling operation so when uh, the drilling happens it has to pass through the moon pool over here and the uh, drilling uh, star commences into the ocean floor so the though the uh, sorry though this is a ship in construction it differs from a conventional ship with in the sense that it has got a huge uh, uh, hole right at the center which you would not find in any other uh, ships now what are the common equipments on a uh, on a rig now i am not differentiating here between a land and an offshore rig uh, i am talking of the common equipments and the common equipment that you would see are a top drive a draw works a mud pump a bop when i say bop it is not the balance of payment that all the financials uh, and the finance minister or the rbi is really worried about at this point in time because of the covid situation but it is an equally important uh, equipment on a, a offshore rig uh, or, or a land rig my pardon on an, a, a, a drilling rig which actually prevents certain disasters Uh, it's a protection equipment 
and just as a, B, a, a good BOP is, uh, is good for the country, balance of payment is good for the country, uh, working healthy BOP is essential for in an offshore rig. And then, of course, we have the diesel engines. This does not constitute all the, this five listed here does not constitute every single thing, but it is essentially a common thing. And there are hundreds of other equipment that play an equally important role in completing uh, the entire rig. What these are, how do they look like? We will ha have a quick view. Do I need to pause and take questions or should I continue, Kishore? Uh, Please continue, sir. It's, it's really interesting. Please continue. We will have Q&A at the end. Thank you. OK, now the, this yellow, uh, yellow, orange or yellow equipment here is called the top drive. This is an essential, this is actually the heart of a drilling uh, rig, whether it's a land rig or an offshore rig, uh, this is the heart of the rig. As long as this is doing its job of rotating the bit to the right, uh, the cash registers for the companies are ticking. Uh, how do they tick? We will cover in a few say, slides down the line. So any rig, when they say the bit is turning to the right, means the rig is actually making money. So uh, essentially, this is hung from with the help of wire rope. This picture is actually incomplete. There are, there's a section of pulleys and wire ropes here. And it is hung from the direct right at the uh, top. It is hung from here. And the uh, top right slides up and down the direct on all the rigs, whether it's land or in uh, the offshore rigs, with the help of a pulley and wire rope system. It's got a huge number of other auxiliary equipments like pipe handlers and other things. I don't want to go into the technical aspects of it. You'll see here a glass panel window. Where this is in the oil world, we call it the doghouse. The internal view of this is like uh, is here on, to, on this side, uh, this picture here, where you have a driller, an assistant driller, and a few other important people sitting there and coordinating the entire drilling process. Uh, this picture here is of a completely automated uh, high-end rig, but certain jackups that are there in the market particularly in the uh, uh, Mumbai high, are not just sophisticated. They are uh, of an older generation. The configuration uh, obviously differs between company uh, to company, the type of rig, the features that the uh, rigs offer. This is the nerve center of the, the, this entire section is the nerve center of the drilling rig. Uh, and in, on a normal, working day when the when the drilling operations is in full progress uh, the access to this i'm sorry the access to this uh, place is restricted and we need to take prior permission from the driller if uh, a, a person who is not assigned to a job here has to access, uh, go up here for any maintenance or any discussion or anything for that matter the, it's kind it's marked as a red zone primarily because there are so many moving parts and there's so much of activity going on over here that uh, it, it's a potential hazard for a person uh, to just walk past uh, uh, and he would e eventually get into trouble. The next is the draw works. Now, as I said here, this is hung from the uh, direct with the help of a pulley arrangement. So I obviously would need an equipment to pull this up and down. And this draw works is a winch that is used for pulling it up and down. Now, this draw works essentially would have a minimum of two motors working in tandem, electric motors. Some rigs would go up to as high as four rigs. The reason for that much amount of uh, electrical horsepower requirement is the weight of this equipment itself is huge. Plus, additionally, it has to handle uh, the full weight of the drill, drill string. Uh, it could be, as we saw earlier, from ranging from 6,000 meters right up to uh, about 10,000 or 12,000 odd meters. So that much amount of weight uh, this uh, uh, 
drawworks would have to handle at any given time to pull uh, once the drilling operations is completed the entire drill string has to be pulled up to pull that up it requires that amount of torque handling capabilities so it is a tremendous uh, uh, work uh, workforce i would say here the next uh, is the mud pump now uh, the, the drilling technology, before I get to this, I would just go to the next slide for a quick uh, view. This is the drill bit that is actually doing the operation of drilling in the ocean, ocean floor or in the uh, land floor. And as it turns, it displaces a lot of cut, uh, cuttings. Now, this cutting, if it is in land, it, it, uh, it is uh, sucked up and stored separately. But if it is in the ocean floor, we are not permitted to just throw it out in the bottom of the ocean. The uh, pollution control norms globally are so strict that uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is a criminal offense to leave these cuttings display, uh, disposed of in the ocean floor. They have to be essentially brought back up to the wreck and uh, discharged in a contained manner. So to bring this back up, this mud pump actually uh, pumps a fluid called mud. That's the reason we call it a drilling fluid called mud at a very high pressure. The pressure could range anywhere between 2,500 PSI to about 7,500 PSI or even more. The, uh, uh, this mud pump would stroke at about a 105 maximum of 105 uh, strokes per minute but that 105 strokes per minute is enough to generate the required uh, pressure and that pressure will ensure that this cuttings are brought back onto the rig so essentially this drill uh, string here that you see is a hollow piece of pipe right from the top drive the, the drilling, the uh, mud, uh, mud that is pumped would go in through this, go through this uh, piece of equipment uh, shaft here, and then into the drill string that starts from here and go right up to this point. And through this holes, it pumps out and brings back the cuttings onto this, uh, back onto the surface. So that is the, so the mud pump is essentially a very crucial equipment uh, for a safe operation of a rig. In addition to uh, bringing up this uh, cuttings, this also plays a role in a well-controlled situation. Now, when I talk of a well-controlled situation, let us assume that I have finished drilling and I have reached the uh, I have been able to puncture the reservoir uh, and I have access the oil now once the oil has been hit what happens is because of the amount of pressure that the oil has been subjected to over for such a long duration of time it uh, and because of the uh, uh, the uh, access for it to go uh, uh, the pressure to be released out the uh, the oil would try to start gushing back from the uh, open uh, well hole here but the, uh, the rigs are not meant for extraction of oil. The rigs are meant for drilling of oil and a safe and proper contain, uh, capping of the well so that the production team can come back, say, probably in six months' time with all the other infrastructure in place and open the uh, uh, well in a controlled fashion, just as you have a regulator for your gas cylinder, they would have a regulator there and that would regulate the uh, uh, flow of oil from this well. So till the production team comes, I'm uh, uh, from the rig pers point perspective, the oil is supposed to stay in the uh, well. So till uh, the capping of the well is perfectly done, the, uh, the mud pump is uh, used to uh, pump uh, the mud so that the uh, uh, the, uh, the back pressure from the well is not uh, much more than the mud pump pressure. So the, the, the mud pump is always in control of the uh, well. And it, if it is the other way around, 
it could lead to a major catastrophe. That it has happened in the past. We would uh, work. We would look at it in a few slides from down the line. Now, to make all these operations, uh, okay. If, uh, as I said earlier, uh, this is the uh, up close and personal view of the blowout preventer. This uh, essentially would weigh about 300 to 400 tons. The height of this would be about four stories high, uh, four story building high. And it's got multiple valves and ramps in place. And the drill string would be passing through this section here and go right down into the well head over here. So when the drill string has been pulled out, the operator, the driller would use this control panel and close the uh, valves as per his requirement. Now, in case of a situation where the uh, uh, he is he has lost control of the well and uh, there is a back pressure coming up which he is not able to control then the only option for him is to abandon the well and the abandonment is done by the help of these uh, ramps that are there here multiple ramps these ramps what they would do is they would just break the uh, drill string and uh, hold the uh, pressure of the oil that is coming out from the well. And, and once the, the drill string has been cut here, the balanced drill string that is here is left as it is. And, the one, and then the rig is then able to abandon this well and go to a safe location. But in certain cases, in extreme cases, that situation has not, uh, they were not in a position to you know, safely uh, uh, evacuate from this well. We would look at that in a couple of slides down. This is the overview of the drilling process. The, uh, uh, the, I've taken a picture of a drill ship. You can replace this with a semi-sub. You can replace this with a, a, a jack-up rig or a swamp batch. But when you replace this with a jack-up rig, this BOP sits on the jackup. When, if uh, in the other two cases, uh, in case of a drill ship or a semi sub, the uh, BOP sits on right on the ocean floor. Now, uh, since this is uh, sitting on the ocean floor, the jackup, uh, sorry, the, the semi sub and the drill ship would have an additional crew called subsea whose job is to ensure that this BOP is in a, maintained in a perfect, uh, is working at any given point in time. So when the drilling starts, it starts with a higher cross section. And after a certain section has been achieved, the cross section reduces. This process goes on and the cross section determination is not done by the rig but it is done by the geologist sitting in the uh, office. Once a prospect of a well has been, a prospect of oil has been established in a particular location, it's the role of the geologist to uh, uh, come up with numbers in terms of what could be the volume of uh, crude that is available there, how many years it would be available, the cost economics are worked out, then the deployment starts, exploratory wells are struck. Uh, the, from the exploratory wells, they uh, correlate with the data, what the geologists have. If it matches, then they, uh, uh, they go into the next phase of uh, full-fledged uh, uh, establishment of a complete well there. And after all the wells, the desired number of wells have been dug, only then the uh, prospect goes into the production platform, production stage. The entire process would take anywhere between two to three years or probably even five years from the time they have identified a prospect to the time it goes into full fledged production could uh, stretch anywhere up to five years. So that is the kind of cost economics that has to be worked out to in ensure that you know, you are actually working on uh, the right side of the figures. To 
uh, ensure that all these equipments, whether it's a land rig or it's an uh, ocean rig, offshore drilling, uh, to ensure that these equipments uh, have the required electrical power available, we have multiple sets of engines, uh, diesel engines working uh, on the rig. Uh, so essentially, we are guzzling diesel to explore uh, for oil. The uh, specification of the engines, the uh, number of engines, all that is defined by the size of the rig and the uh, class identification of the rig. So uh, a lot of engineering has to go into it. Now you might wonder, why did I say even for a land rig? For a land rig, you could probably think that you could run power lines to a land rig. Now uh, you have to uh, imagine these land rigs are actually mobile. That once a prospect of a well has been established, a rig goes in, it, it's, it doesn't go in, in the way that you see in from the offshore uh, rigs. They all go there as disassembled parts on, a tra on multiple trailer trucks. And once they reach location, the whole thing is assembled uh, as a building block and the drilling starts. Once the uh, required number of wells have been dug in that location, it, and the building blocks are disassembled, loaded on trailers, moved to a new location, probably 20, 30 kilometers away, and another set of wells uh, would start commence there. So running, sorry, running power lines uh, for this intermittent uh, movement would not be a feasible option. So even in case of land wrecks, you would have an in-house uh, diesel uh, generators uh, working for the complete electricity requirements. Any questions up to this point, or should I go ahead, Kundal? I think, sir, you can take a minute of break uh, because you have been continuously presenting. Otherwise, uh, you have, I think, a good friend of yours who is answering a lot of questions in the comment also from other people. Like people had question how decision of where to, uh, you know, where to drill. So he has answered that Jeff, Jeff, do you know Jeff? Ah, uh, yeah, he is my friend from Thailand. I asked him to be on. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay. So Jeff is there with you. Then another gentleman who says that he has worked for you and a very high regard. I highlighted that comment also. So your colleagues have been helping in the question and answer in the comment section. Okay. Good okay. of them. However, yeah. Them. However, if you want, you can take a minute of break or continue. It's all up to you, sir. Yeah, I'm, I'm good to go. Good to Great. Go. Okay. Um, in an offshore vessel, based upon the type of vessel for a jackup rig, uh, the number of people at any given point of time would be about 100 to 120 people. Uh, when I talk of 120 people, it would be uh, categorized as uh, broad classification would be a set of people from the oil company side and another set of uh, company from, uh, people from the rig owner side. Now, when I split uh, the rig owner side from the rig side, you would have an offshore installation manager who is the actually the boss of the rig. And under him, you would have a tool pusher uh, who handles the, uh, coordinates the activities uh, and other things. Then you would have the maintenance crew, the mechanical, the electrical maintenance crew. And if it's a large rig, you would have a separate electronic maintenance crew as well. And uh, then the drilling department headed by the driller, the assistant driller, the night drillers, and uh, the, uh, the crew, entire crew on the rig floor who handle all the uh, uh, other activities. Now, all these people have to be accommodated. And uh, we have some beautiful accommodations here. It's uh, normally a, a bunker type accommodation, fully air conditioned. And we have uh, a, a galley providing us the food at uh, regular intervals. And we have uh, laundry service. And uh, the other thing that uh, we, the normal working hours on a rig is 12 hours a day. Where, so uh, typically a shift would uh, start at six in the morning and end at uh, 1800 hours in the evening. And another set of crew would start work at 1800 hours and go on till six in the morning. 
certain tracks for some reason they have uh, the drill crew working on a kind of a taper different uh, uh, times uh, scale they operate between 1200 hours to 2400 hours and another drill crew working from 2400 hours to 1200 hours so essentially uh, a lot of uh, crew members working on different ships so we have the comfort of our individual bunker to uh, you know, have the time to relax and refresh and get uh, ready for the next day's work. Then uh, we do have uh, certain gyms, uh, certain uh, rigs do have full-fledged uh, gyms and workout uh, centers. And we have either a personal TV in the room or we would have a, a common TV point depending upon the size of the rig. And we also have a hospital. Uh, this actually would cater to the minor ailments like some cuts and bruises or a fever or a cough and things like that. But if there is something severe, uh, then the, you can be rest assured within uh, four hours of the incident being reported, the patient would be uh, transported by uh, air to the nearest uh, full-fledged hospital with the best medical care available. There have been instances uh, in my own uh, observations that people have been rushed because of uh, various reasons. So uh, medical care is of paramount. And we also have a private uh, helideck. And uh, my friend Jeff used to always say, oh, we don't drive to work. We only fly to work. So we, always, we have our own private helideck to cater to the pers uh, personal transfer to and from the wreck. Okay, now here comes the, uh, any questions until this point or should I take a? Please continue, sir. Please okay. continue. Okay. Now, so I've got the question answered for you. I'm, I was pretty sure that people would, because of the finance background, people are uh, from this course that uh, they, uh, they would, the next question that would automatically pop up is, kitna lagta hai ye sab? So your answers are there in front of you. The uh, rental for a jackup would essentially be around 25,000 to about 150,000. The Kratong in uh, the Gulf of Thailand, when I was there, she was on a contract for $140,000. Uh, that was for a five-year contract. And the semi subs would range from 60,000 to about 600,000, and drill ships from 40, 400,000 to 800,000. These are just ballpark figures, uh, just out of my uh, discussions with people and a little bit of Google search. But you have to read the fine print. These are daily rates, or otherwise called as day rates in the offshore or in the oil uh, parlance. And these are paid only when the bit is turning to the right, which essentially means that all the equipments related to the drilling are ready to roll. Otherwise, if any of the equipments, whether it's the top drive, the mud pumps, the draw works, the engines, if any one of these, or the BOP, if any one of these have a problem, then the rig is classified to be on downtime. And normally the oil company would give about 15 minutes of time, grace time for the rig crew to rectify it. And if the uh, downtime exceeds 15 minutes, then it is uh, automatically uh, knocked off from the pro rata day rates that the rig uh, would get paid for. So now that you're explaining yeah. commercials, questions yeah. have started pouring in. And then we have Venkatesh Gunaparthi. His question is, any such renting companies originating out of India? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. He's asking, is there any renting company which is originating out of India? Yes, general, general drilling is there. It's a listed company, sir? Uh, I have my doubts. I have my doubts. I okay. didn't do my I didn't know my homework. If somebody can just pull up general drilling, uh, but I'm sure pretty sure general drilling is there as a company. I'm not sure whether they are listed in. in oh, the sure, we will we will find out. No worries, sir. We will find out. Okay. So, this is the uh, cost of rental on a daily basis. Now, the next slide would uh, give you the cost of ownership. If say tomorrow Kundan decides that he wants to be an angel investor. 
for a rig, then he would want to know what is the uh, ballpark figures for a rig. And these are the figures that I just uh, uh, Googled out. And for a land rig, the cost of ownership of a rig would be around 25 to 40 million US dollars for a jack up in excess of 200 million dollars, a semi sub in excess of 400 million dollars, and a drill ship uh, in excess of about 800 million dollars. These are absolutely off the uh, cuff uh, figures. It could be off by a few million. And I shouldn't be pinned down tomorrow if somebody wants to really invest in, in a complete rig. So we got the answer, sir. One from the learner has given. It's listed on both BSC and NSC, the company I think you said. It's general uh, drilling. General drilling, yeah. And it's, okay. I, I'm not sure. I have not checked. Uh, it is Sanjay Parmar who has commented. Okay. I can also see, but then I would like to believe Sanjay. Okay. There is another company. I'm not sure whether it is... Aban Offshore. Aban Offshore. Aban Offshore. I was about to say Shantanu that. Shantanu Saha is saying Aban Offshore. So yeah. Shantanu is also a senior person here. Uh, what about Global Vectra? Someone is also suggesting. Then one more name I read. Uh, Jindal Drilling and Industries Limited. Yeah, that is the one that I mentioned. Jindal Drilling. You said gen, general Jindal. or you said no, no, Jindal, 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 J I N D A L, Jindal. Okay, Jindal. okay, okay. So, Jindal Drilling and Industries is there. I think yeah. uh, Mr. Sanjay has said about the same. And then uh, SR Energy, someone is saying Global Vector. Uh, yeah, SR. SR. SR is also there, yeah. But these are uh, uh, regional players. They they are not global players. They their presence outside the uh, Indian uh, uh, oil and gas space is not there. They do. I doubt they have any contract, any presence outside the, of India. Right, sir. Many so they many are, they, they, they are also coming. So Mr. Shah is saying about Global Vectra, which is uh, like a helicopter service company. Okay. Global Vectra is a helicopter service company. I'm not sure whether this is the company which is also giving helicopter service to the one you shown in the pictures. Um, Global Vectra could be, could be. There, there, are, lo there are a lot of companies uh, in India. It is Pavan Hans, which, uh, which is handling ONGCs uh, or yeah. chopper services, which okay. is again a government company. Pavan Hans is a government company. Okay, okay. Now, when we talk of oil companies, the first thing that comes to my mind is ONGC, Mera Bharat Mahan. So obviously ONGC should be on the top of the list. Uh, then just off the hand, I pulled up Chevron, BP, Aramco, Saudi Aramco. Saudi Aramco, incidentally, is the world's largest company. Uh, it should act technically be on the top of the oil companies list. But uh, as I said earlier, Mera Bharat Mahan, so ONGC should be on the top. When it comes to rig owners, uh, okay, thanks to the response that I find, there are a lot of Indian companies listed, but uh, the global players that I have referred to are Velaris uh, with about 50 jackups, eight semi subs, and 16 drill ships. Uh, general drilling, to my knowledge, would have about one or two uh, jackups, medium specification jackups not more than that. So when you look at those figures, compare them to these figures here, they just pale in comparison. Transocean, they have a presence in India. As I said earlier, KG Basin, they, they are operating. Uh, they have 12 semi-subs and 27 drill ships. Then we have Neighbors, which is a leading player in the land rig segment with about 378 land rigs, six jackups and 34 uh, uh, platform rigs. And shelf drilling. Shelf drilling, incidentally, was an offshoot from Transocean. Transocean owned predominantly um, uh, most of these uh, jackups and swamp badge. And when they decided that they needed to get out of the uh, shallow water drilling and go in, focus their attention on uh, deep water and ultra deep water, uh, when they decided to sell uh, the jackups, a company shell drilling was born and they went in and purchased all the transocean jackup rigs essentially a set of uh, people from transocean quit started shell drilling and then purchased these uh, jackups uh, with venture capital and angel investors support 
and now it is listed on the Oslo uh, Stock Exchange. So uh, just uh, to the, the the rigs are owned by these uh, companies and they are contracted by the oil companies. ONGC2 has a couple of uh, rigs on its own balance sheet. Uh, I think Sagar Bhushan is the name of one of the rigs. But uh, over a period of time, they found that hiring a rig from any one of these players is much more cost economical than having a, a fleet of rigs on their own. And it kind of makes sense because the, the kind of investment that go into it and the return on investment of owning a rig uh, is uh, not as a, uh, that proportionate for a company like ONGC to be having those rigs on their balance sheet. So essentially when uh, an oil company decides that they need a rig for a particular prospect exploration, they would come up with a bid document specifying what kind of a rig that they are looking for, jack up or a semi-sub or a, a drill ship. And in that classification, they would then go deeper into what kind of uh, uh, drawworks, uh, the uh, load bearing capacity that they require, what kind of mud pumps they would require, pressure handling capabilities, what kind of engines backup that they would require. The whole set of uh, specifications would be frozen by the uh, oil company. And then it is up to these uh, rig companies to find a rig that meets all the specifications set out by the oil companies from their portfolio of uh, rigs that they have and then position it and uh, bid for that uh, contract. So contracts are generally awarded uh, in India, ONGC awards contract on an annual basis, but globally, uh, Contracts are very flexible. They don't look at annual. Uh, they have seen contracts for just single well uh, drilling. The rig was in Malay, uh, somewhere in Malaysia, and it went to Japan for just one well, about 30-day campaign. Uh, they had a contract. And certain contracts could be three months, six months, or it could be an extended contract of five years. Like I said earlier, the Kratong was, had a, had a five-year contract with Chevron. Uh, the fi uh, 5006 had a five-year contract with uh, uh, with Impex and the Japanese company, oil company in Australia. So the contracts are flexible. It's only ONGC in India that you know gives it on an annual basis so that they don't have to go through the process all over again. And uh, the rates that we uh, discussed in the previous slide, the, the jackups that uh, ONGC uh, hires are in this price packet, $25,000. I think there was a question from some of your viewers about what kind of uh, rates that uh, ONGC uh, looks at. So the predominant uh, jackups that are there in the Mumbai High, whether it is from Jindal or from Aban Offshore or from Shell Drilling, uh, all of them are in the 25 to 35 uh, price packet. To me, it is one of the lowest uh, 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 you know, uh, day rates, I would say. And globally, uh, people refer India has the graveyard of uh, rigs, uh, which essentially means the rigs that are being retired globally come here to work at such low day rates. The, the rigs that are there, sorry to say this in an open forum, uh, the rigs that are there in uh, Mumbai High are as old uh, as my age, 50 plus years old. So uh, the kind of efficiencies that you can expect out of them, the kind of performances that you can expect out of them, the kind of safety aspects that you can expect out of them, the kind of facilities that you can expect out of them are that uh, that different compared to the other jackups in this price band. There is no comparison between a rig of 150,000 day rate with a mere 25,000 day rate. Uh, the the, uh, the galley, the, the entire thing is, uh, they're just worlds apart. I mean, there's nothing more to say than that. Okay, the next flu, uh, few slides contain some disturbing graphics and information. Viewers' discretion is absolutely requested. Uh, I would take a pause here, particularly weak-hearted people. I would caution you uh, about 
continuing to view this uh, presentation because it would be on the go uh, on the dark side of the oil and gas industry are we running short of time Kundan? no not at all okay um, this question is life all rosy on uh, in our quest for oil uh, you would think that oh the uh, the offshore industry has got uh, their own uh, air condition accommodation they have food on demand they have laundry they have this that they have recreation everything so life is all good but the answer to that is an emphatic no when you talk to an uh, a person in the industry the, about uh, tragedies that have happened in the past the foremost thing that comes to everybody's mind is Piper Alpha. This was in the year uh, on the night of 6th of uh, July 1988 when a massive explosion took place and unfortunately 167 people on that uh, location uh, died without any possibility of escape. This was not an oil rig, it was actually a production platform but still uh, the casualty was pretty high. God bless these 167 family members. It was a real tragedy that they had to endure. The reason for this fault was uh, determined to be a lack of communication between two shift groups. The day shift had closed a particular valve for a reason that there was maintenance activity going on in a particular tank. And the night shift crew was not informed that the valve should not be open. And... Uh, Inadvertently, when the night shift crew, one of them saw that the valve was closed, which should have actually been open, he, without questioning the, the reason why it was uh, closed, he decided to open it. And within seconds, this explosion took place, with uh, leaving no possibility of escape for anybody. Uh, the overall damages, uh, as per Wikipedia, uh, this was estimated to be about $2 billion uh, US dollars in property damage. The next is a more recent one. This is from the uh, in, back in uh, April uh, 20th in 2010, uh, a rig called Deepwater Horizon, a DP vessel uh, owned by uh, Transocean and on contract to BP. Uh, well, while drilling one of the most difficult wells, and I think it was about 18. Uh, uh, close to about 18,000 feet of water uh, drilling depth that they had achieved, one of the longest uh, drilling depths. And uh, uh, they had some encountered a lot of difficulties as a result of which the uh, planned number of days had overrun by 18 days. This rig was on a contract at about $495,000 a day. And the uh, officials in Houston BP office were worried that the budget for this well was overshooting by quite a big amount and they would be answerable to the financial head. And in a hurry to complete and move on, they decided to push the reg uh, to, compl to complete the well in a hurry. Overlooking the fact that one of the critical tests after a well completion, the results were not as expected, but still there was a pressure to you know, uh, overlook it and close it and get going. Get, uh, go, go, go was the uh, screaming uh, advice given from the uh, office in Houston. As a result of which, much against the uh, in, uh, intervention of the rig crew that know that is not the way forward, the oil company put its foot down and with the result, uh, the uh, well was not uh, completed properly and there was a massive explosion, an infermo of uh, uh, a kind of a volcano of methane gas erupted and within seconds engulfed the, uh, engulfed the uh, rig. And unfortunately, about 11 people died on the spot and about 17 uh, were seriously injured. Uh, this uh, and the uh, cleanup and penalty operations, the cleanup took about six months or even longer. Uh, and the penalty imposed on BP was in excess of about 54 billion uh, US dollars, one of the, the largest penalties imposed on a company for default on their uh, 
commitments to the environment and safe operating procedures. What essentially happened was here after the well completion, uh, when the tests were proven to be negative, they, uh, they were in a hurry to uh, close and move forward. Uh, the, the procedures were not properly followed. And when this explosion took place, uh, the engines that were there on the rig completely blacked out. As I said, this, deep, this is a DP-3 vessel, which is said the DP-3 classification stands for dynamically positioned three, which essentially means that you have three levels of defenses, that if once first the first level of defense fails, you have the second level defense that comes in and uh, keeps you uh, afloat. If that too fails, then you have the third level uh, of defense that comes into play. In this particular case, all the three levels of defense was shattered in one single master stroke, with the result that the, the rig blacked out in within seconds of the explosion, and there was no power for communicating to the uh, BOP, that stack that was right at the bottom of the ocean floor, to uh, abandon the well, share off the drill string and close the contain the damage. Though the BOP was in operating condition, it was waiting on an instruction from the rig above and the instruction could not be relayed on because there was no backup power available. That was the extent of damage, in, in instantaneous damages. It's one of the tragic uh, events in the history. Subsequent to this, of course, there was a lot of uh, deliberations and a lot of uh, procedures put in place. We would go over that in a few slides. One might ask if there is so much of uh, risk involved, are there no protection systems involved? Are there no lifeboats? Yes, every uh, ocean-going vessel, whether it is a uh, uh, whether it is a drilling vessel, drilling rig, or a uh, crude oil container, or a normal cargo ship, or a passenger ship, would have in a sufficient number of uh, life support equipments like uh, lifeboats and life rafts. In the case of the deep water, sorry, in the case of the deep water horizon, uh, when the explosion occurred. Uh, there is supposed to be a certain protocol followed for mustering at the lifeboat. And once all the people have assembled, only then the lifeboat is supposed to be deployed. But when you see uh, uh, the kind of extent of damage and uh, that is engulfing the rig, the, uh, the pressure to lower the lifeboat and get away uh, is so high that they would they have actually uh, abandoned a few people on back on the rig. Uh, and they had no access to the lifeboat. They had no access to the life raft. And a few of them had to jump from the heli deck of the rig, which uh, to the ocean floor is about 10 uh, floors or 11 floor high. Uh, to the, from that level, they had jumped to just escape from the burning uh, rig. This uh, entire... Uh, uh, sequence of events was well captured in a movie called uh, by the same name, Deepwater Horizon, by Mark Wahlberg. And if you get the time, uh, I would recommend uh, watching this movie, but have a very strong heart because uh, the the end is not what you would normally associate with any movies. It is not a happy ending. The the tragedy that uh, that went that these people went through. Uh, is uh, unbelievable. I would not want any offshore worker ever to be in that uh, line of fire. Every offshore worker would uh, that who needs to go to uh, work in an offshore uh, oil field or whether it is a rig or a platform has to be uh, undergoing two sets of uh, trainings. One is a biannual uh, uh, medical uh, test and another is a uh, uh, BOSIET, uh, which is basic offshore safety induction training and a helicopter underwater escape training. This is valid for four years and it is, uh, it is by a certification body called OPITO. Uh, this is a nonprofit organization formed by uh, all the stakeholders in the uh, offshore oil and gas field 
where they decided to form a non-profit organization for their own benefit uh, and which would have no political influence from any single stakeholder. The picture here you see is a training for an helicopter underwater escape. Essentially, it is in case of a helicopter uh, capsizing into the ocean, when it hits the ocean, uh, the first thing that it would happen is it would turn turtle 180 degrees. The reason is the uh, helicopters are top heavy. The rotor on top is heavier than the uh, body at the bottom. So it would turn at 180 degrees. So we are all, any offshore worker is uh, uh, put into a simulating module and then the module is lowered into a swimming pool and once lowered, it rotates at 180 degrees. And after a certain seven seconds, only then uh, you are supposed to eject out and come into the uh, come out on the right direction. The seven seconds delay is uh, because in case the rotor is still rotating and you are not oriented yourself properly and you happen to go on the wrong direction deeper into the ocean, you don't want to get entangled into the spinning rotor. So that seven second delay was calculated that it, the rotor would have come to a stop by then. But in all uh, this one, the training is you have to orient your uh, uh, body in such a way that even at a 180 degree position, it's if essentially you are actually upside down. And from that upside down position, you have to uh, break open the windows here and then uh, eject yourself out of the uh, helicopter. In a normal helicopter too, these uh, windows that are there on the side uh, as well as on the doors are all ejectable from inside. There is a procedure which is explained during the briefing as we board the helicopter, uh, how to eject it and escape in case of an emergency. Once we eject out, we, uh, we have to pull the uh, life raft off the helicopter and how to board it or if there is no life raft, how to, uh, or if you are escaping from a, from a burning rig, how to make a uh, pool of yourself and uh, ward off potential predatory, predatory uh, preys that are there, like uh, sharks and other things, how to ward them off is all part of the Bozier training. An extensive training, two to three days, and uh, it, uh, every single person has to uh, be aware of all these uh, procedures. But let me tell you one thing, in an emergency of this nature, the, your instinct for survival uh, will have to act. There are instances where people have just frozen, unable to comprehend what is, what is happening, even after undergoing all these uh, Bossier trainings. They just froze in their place and they were not able to react. The mind reacted in a very different fashion. So essentially, you're in a situation like this. God forbid nobody should be there. But if they are there, it, the, the reaction time of the mind is crucial for an escape and to safety. So this, deep, uh, this is the report that the Deepwater Horizon Committee submitted to the uh, then President of uh, United States of America, uh, Barack Obama, where uh, they clearly spelled out that it was the greed of BP that resulted in a severe uh, catastrophe of this nature to have happened. This report, about 400 pages, it's a very damning uh, report on BP and its, uh, uh, you know, safety uh, uh, track record. And it was, it, it's pretty, uh, you know, difficult to read this report because it gives so much of information and uh, which in hindsight, if BP had been a little more uh, cautious, this disaster could have been averted. It was purely a man-made disaster, probably one of the largest uh, man-made disasters that people have known. Now, one interesting question that probably people uh, would have is uh, with all these kind of disasters that are happening, uh, can we not have a remote uh, drilling? Well, if, if we have a remote uh, 
unmanned spacecrafts, if we have, if Google is testing uh, a, unmanned, uh, a driverless car, uh, the oil industry is not far behind. And as Mr. Sanjeev Gupta last week said that uh, the oil is there for the next 100 years. So there is a lot of uh, uh, research going on. And presently, uh, research is going on into deploying completely unmanned oil rigs. So that is the future. And if that happens, the risk of human losses would be greatly eliminated. When it would happen, uh, well, we would have to wait and see. But that research and the development R&D on that is at a very, very advanced stage uh, is what I'm given to understand. It would be a technological marvel if it happens because uh, right in the middle of an ocean with no human control, if an equipment is to be operating on its own, of course, the data would be relayed to a centralized location where uh, a set of people would be continuously monitoring it. But for an equipment to just do work on its own it would be a, definitely a technological marvel. This would essentially be uh, useful in harsh environments, particularly in places like uh, North Sea, where the weather can change uh, in minutes from normal weather to really absurd blizzards blowing, or even in places like Alaska, where we have drilling. Uh, it, it, those kind of extreme uh, environments, uh, it would be a real blessing to have this uh, unmanned uh, drilling uh, oil rigs working over there. Now, what does this all translate to in terms of uh, economics for the company? Now, I'm sure uh, as most of us here in this uh, forum are from the financial background side, they would be interested were to know what happened to BP stock after the uh, disaster on 20th of April of 2010. Well, I have the answer for you. Prior to April of 2010, it was uh, the stock was trading at about $60 on an average. And within a month of the uh, accident, the stock just tumbled and tumbled and tumbled right down to about $27. See the amount of selling that has happened over the last, the, uh, the market capitalization eroded, the uh, confidence in the shareholders has dropped dramatically. It did raise after the, uh, to a certain point, but not to the extent that it could reach, regain its past glorious days of 70 odd dollars a share price. It's still tottering. It was tottering at around 40 before the COVID took it down further to about 23, $24. Uh, uh, and you can see the blanks here where the company could not pay the dividend that they have been paying for a long time. There was a break in the dividend paying because of the $54 billion penalty that was imposed on them that the entire cash reserves, probably much more than that would have been wiped out. Part of it would have been uh, the insurance companies would have probably taken a hit too, but uh, at what cost? The next time when BP went into the market for insurance, the uh, premium for insurance would have uh, uh, gone up exponentially. The reason, one of the reasons why this uh, company could not regain this level, if you look at uh, its competitors like Chevron or uh, any other uh, total uh, equivalent companies in the global market in the oil uh, field, their share prices over the over this corresponding period have been steadily raising. But this company has just stack, uh, stuttered at the $40 mark, primarily because the track record of safety of this company prior to this incident of 2010 have been bad. There was an incident, I think, in 2005 or six in Texas, an oil, a BP oil refinery. There was a major blast. Uh, luckily for them, if my memory serves me right, there was no human casualty, but the property damages uh, were very high. So uh, a single accident or a series of accidents can essentially pull a company down where they just can't recover. And if I may add to what Mr. Uh, uh, Sanjeev Gupta mentioned uh, in an open forum last time uh, about uh, Vedanta, uh, considering the aspects of oil and gas, the, uh, the, the uh, risk per, uh, that 
this business brings into the table, uh, I personally would not be a confident investor in a Vedanta stock for the simple reason that if a disaster of this nature happens to Vedanta, it is going to erode my entire uh, investment in the company. And I am pretty sure that it would not even reach this level. It would just be lying flat at the bottom of the uh, curve. That uh, is a brief of, I think I've overstepped my, oh, uh, overstepped my one hour time zone. Uh, no, it was really interesting because it was such a wholesome presentation. Uh, be, it, be it beginner or be it people who already know about this subject, for all of them it will be an eye opener. When you do research, you need to know these intricacies. I got to learn today that what are the different type of rigs, who are the companies, you know, who have what kind of rigs with them in their inventory, you know, where Indian companies are standing and so many other things. However, I know you personally now, I um, feel fortunate. I can always come back with my queries when I'm researching. This is the time learners should get the opportunity to ask you a question. If you have 15, 20 minutes more, because you have been already tired, I'm sure, one and a half no, hours. No, no, no. So this is a subject that I would love to speak any day. And sure, uh, so it, it gives yeah. me the required energy and I'm ready for questions if there are any. Yes, yes. There are so many questions which are coming. And without, uh, you know, any wasting any time uh, let me I'm highlight off the presentation yes we can exclude that now one second yes so now the presentation is over so guys yeah we are open for the questions and uh, meanwhile i would like to thank jeff uh, the friend of mr rajesh and another colleague of mr rajesh from past uh, who has worked with him i just missed his name but he was here he said that he worked with you and he was writing very good words about you that oh, you got such a great knowledge on this uh, subject. So guys, you One have a question is. Yeah, yeah, I just forgot his name. I'm sorry, I should have noted it down. No, but no, we no can rewind the video and see. He, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> so this is also recorded. So guys, uh, you can ask your questions actually. So sir, can I take some questions which are directly related with companies, which people yeah. want to Okay, here is the question. What is the future of IOC? Is it a good investment? You can skip whichever you want to skip. Unsolicited advice is not uh, something we can no. give on open platform, but so then I as just, you can always comment. Indian Oil Corporation, I don't want to comment on any specific companies. I'm, I'm a learner as far as uh, assessment of companies are concerned. What I brought out today is kind of a SWOT analysis on the oil sector, on uh, the uh, threat perceptions part of it. Now, it's with this information, it's for the informed investor, investors to go and look in their portfolio what kind of companies they have invested in. It need not be in the oil industry. It could be in any other industry. For example, I would say that uh, I'm sure most of the Indians are aware that on 7th of May 2020, there was a, a gas leak in my hometown of Vishakapatnam from a company called LG Polymers. Right, That company uh, is not traded in the Indian Stock Exchange, but LG Chemical, the parent company, is traded in the Korean Stock Exchange. So after the gas leak, out of curiosity, I just looked up the stock pricing of LG Korea and uh, in the Korean stock market. And I found that there was a 2% drop. Reuters had uh, flagged this uh, fire, uh, this uh, gas leak and there was a 2% uh, drop in the, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, share prices of LG chemicals. So these kind of uh, SWOT analysis is what people can do. Uh, out of the information that I presented. Individual companies, no. DDK, G1, and two ordered by Reliance and later on, so transition. So this is for you, sir. Someone, okay. you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I kind of uh, uh, suspected that, but uh, I thought they, were, they had some stake in this rate, so that's the reason. Uh, because it was not out in the open as to why they, uh, they named it as Dhirubhai. I, I tried to... Uh, you know, search right. for it, but I couldn't get it. So thank you, Mr. Shantanu Shah, for, you know, resolving the, probably one of the curiosity. 
whether right or wrong at least we have some information now that no, why it, 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 it could be right i mean i i had some vague i uh, i mean uh, knowledge about it but i wasn't 100% sure but uh, now that mr shantanu has brought it up uh, it kind of makes sense yeah thanks thanks shantanu ji uh then investing in drilling companies look at how many rigs they have and how are actively working is yeah, that okay. that uh, yeah that one one aspect that i uh, didn't bring up i think thanks jeff for uh, bringing it up uh, from the portfolio of rigs that are there it doesn't mean that every single one of them have contract okay there it, there would be situations where a rig would be out of contract for over uh, long period it could be 1 2 3 years also in an industry downturn uh, oil industry downturn post 2014 uh, the, i i know personally lot of rigs that have been out of contract for more than 3 years so uh, that amount of le- revenue loss for the company plus an interest burden because they are uh, holding that asset on their balance sheet which is serviced by a debt from the market so uh, so the interest outflow on that asset is uh, is quite tremendous and when when these rigs are out of contract they have two methods of uh, storing it one is a cold stacking where they just leave it out in the open no activity nobody there to maintain it uh, and there is no investment of a rup- uh, dollar on the uh, maintenance of that rig the other is a warm stack in a warm stack there would be a very limited number of personnel who would be working on it just running up systems keeping the uh, engines warm so that when the contract eventually comes the rig doesn't take much time to kick start and get ready for the drilling operation that would cost the company money to you know have people working uh, even though they are not working uh, fully even that partial work that that comes out of them they would need uh, to pay them for, uh, pay for that services that they are rendering so it's again a cost great sir we have manish one question any disruptive technologies that would affect the current offshore drilling oil disruptive technologies to my knowledge no no No, the, the quest no. for oil the quest for oil will continue there are lot of zones of unexplored even in india we are still exploring porbandar uh, in gujarat is one uh, exploratory prospect ongc is working on there are a lot of areas where uh, ongc is exploring for potential oil great sir what is the difference between conventional and unconventional wells this mohit should, this question should have been addressed to mr uh, uh rajat i mean mr sanjeev sharma i suggest that he posts this on your blog and i guess sanjeev sharma would be a bit i am uh, to be honest i am an electrical and automation person my role on the rig when i go to a rig is to if more often not than not it would be a case where the rig is on downtime they are not working they have some uh, issues they scramble get me there i help them fix it and i come back so my, on the electrical equipments not on the uh, drilling or the well itself whatever i presented on the drilling and the well aspect of it it is information that i gathered by talking to the driller the aston driller or keeping my eyes and ears open when i uh, go up to the uh, rig otherwise I, i as i said earlier i'm not an uh, expert on the subject matter everything is on my own uh, absorption of information Excellent. So this question, Mr. Mohit, uh, you would have to put it on yeah, the blog. I'll, I'll, yeah. So I'll share with everyone that how yeah. can they reach out to all the presenters uh, yeah. through my blog. I'll share yeah. that uh, way. He can ask it to Sanjeev ji. He can ask to you, and maybe in future some other people also. Any oil yeah. and gas company which is rigorously working on the automation of oil extraction, Sankalp Mishra. i think you have mentioned about this automation of i think yeah there is a worldwide company called national oil well varco we call it in oil uh, industry as nov nov again i'm repeating that is a, a worldwide company which is into uh, 
into the automation and electrical aspects of drilling. They manufacture mud pump, they manufacture draw works, they manufacture top drive. They are equipment manufacturers and they are pioneers in uh, the field of uh, electrical and automation too. Uh, th that, that is one company that is working on the, uh, you know, scaling up the operations for the automa uh, automation of the oil and gas industry. Okay. Headquarters in, uh, they have offices across the globe. They have engineering R&D centers across the globe. And they also run a university in uh, Houston. Great. So I'm not sure whether I should bring this question to you. But uh, what is the capacity of a storage of oil in India? <laughs> I think uh, again, uh, beyond my scope. And sure. all I know is there is an underground uh, strategic reservoir uh, in uh, Vizag. Actually, it was a location of multiple film shoots uh, in India in from the Tamil and Telugu industry. But that beautiful location was uh, destroyed and a right. strategic reservoir, underground reservoir built in that place for uh, oil storage. What is the capacity? I think Google, uh, ask Google and Google would yes. be the best. Google should answer. answer this. So, sir, we have similar kind of more questions and I think they can be Googled as well. And you being here, I would like to take your uh, precious time of five to ten minutes more where okay. you make that you know you you were a businessman became yeah. consultant and you had this journey and uh, I want you to you know put some light on that aspect of your life and uh, inspire the young generation about how to take on new businesses see I teach a stock market but you know in every class I start with stock market is all about businesses you need yeah. to know businesses you need to learn businesses and you need to have that much of acumen to judge businesses. Doing exactly. business itself is very difficult. A businessman, even after doing or conducting for five to 10 years, he still stay confused that what should be the next step, how he will handle the disasters, how he will handle everything else, right? And on yeah. the other side, you as an investor, stock investor, is going to judge those businesses which you have never done. And that's why probably it makes one of the most difficult subject to study, you know, exactly. however, exactly. in India or in any other country, all we learn probably is how to buy, how to sell, how to do intraday trading, how to do leverage trading. And that's why people blow a lot of money. And that's why I'm promoting and propagating this idea that people should know more about different other businesses, business scenarios in India, understand the intricacies of this specific aspect that how management is very important. People who are running the show are very important. Their ethics is very important. So exactly. if you could, you know, spare five minutes and talk about the business scenario of India, your own experience of being a businessman in past, your, uh, you know, whatever you can put a light so that people can understand more, you know, about if they want to become an entrepreneur in India. Yeah. See. Unfortunately, I would say the business environment in India, if you are trying to set up a manufacturing facility, it's not conducive. It's a PM may say, make an India campaign. Uh, but end of the day, the uh, restrictions that come up from the government organizations themselves the, I'm not sure how it is now in the GST regime, because just around the time when the GST uh, regime was about to start, uh, I had escaped uh, and got into the consultancy, so I don't have to be worried about GST. Uh, I'm an independent consultant, so GST does not apply for me. Uh, but when I was in the VAT regime, we had uh, the excise department, we had the sales tax at the authorities. They had absolute powers over your business. Even at the slightest mistake, they don't see you as a genuine, or they don't differentiate you between a genuine person and, and the, on the other side. They treat every businessman, I'm sorry to say this on an open forum, they could be people from the uh, that departments as probably one of your students as well. But 
they treat every businessman as a chore. So even for the smallest mistake that we do, it could be an inadvertent mistake. It could not. It need not be a glaring, a genuine mistake, right? If there are in businesses we might slip on the due date on a particular submission of a return, or in our calculation we would have missed out something. Even with the computerization, end of the day, the computer doesn't accumulate data on its own. It is a human that actually feeds in the data. The, feed, the data feeding could have been wrong. So instead of 200, the quantity could have been 20 or the other way around. There could be such minor errors. Now, every single thing is viewed with an, with an eye of suspicion. That becomes a, a barrier for people uh, to be working. Now, if I, were to, if, if I have to go to the department to correct it, the first thing that the question uh, that comes up is, is my miracle care? That that mentality has to change. That a businessman is not a thief. That he is. Uh, there are gen, there are good apples. You should not be putting all businessmen all uh, into the same basket. That they are bad apples. Unless that mindset changes, it would be very very difficult for uh, a business people to uh, work in India. It was not just me that who decided to shift from business into consultancy. I have I have a friend of mine who was running a manufacturing unit. Three years, I am sure he would not take offense to uh, taking his reference on this open forum. Uh, three years in a row, best industry, district best industry award, right? And fourth year, his industry was he was forced to close down his industry because of external factors. He was supplying equipments for the uh, power sector. And when power sector was not doing well, his order books depleted and he was not able to sustain his business. So an industry which won three years best industry award in a row, fourth year when they decide to shut shop, the departments were viewing them with suspicion. That there is something wrong that these guys have done. That's the reason they are shutting shop. So we need to investigate them with a fine tooth comb. This just the way is this the way that uh, a genuine businessman should be uh, treated? No, we 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 as in, we as uh, you know we put our blood, we put our sweat into it, and uh, we we expect a certain amount of uh, respectful uh, treatment in, uh, from the departments. That is completely missing. Not just now, it's been there for the time that I was uh, actually in business. Oh, so that's that's like heart-wrenching to hear, uh, Mr. Rajesh, on behalf of your friend. But something, you know, what I want to add here is, even if we look at the government, their source of also revenue is tax, right? Exactly, exactly. So if businesses are not doing well, I'm sure yeah. government will be also in trouble one day. Right? Exactly. We, exactly. We, we have to have those environment where businesses should do well. What I clearly see here with your example is that there is a huge deficit of trust between businessmen and people who are running the show, be it yeah. bureaucrats or the government. Some point of time, I also feel that without being political, I mean, whether we, our government is a government, whether it's a BJP led government or a Congress led government, they yes. are chosen government by ours. And we should, we can differentiate them during the, you know, elections, but post that there should be a very strong trust from both of the side. Like at this exactly. point of time, we must trust our government, even them, when we have voted against them and government should trust people also like if they are doing something they are doing with the great intent so this trust deficit is very high in india people are not ready to trust anyone and it yeah. happens even in the business sectors it happens that bureaucrat don't trust businessmen businessmen don't trust bureaucrats or even the government and that's the reason you know i was studying about the great depression of 1929 because of this Corona thing, which has came and financial pandemic is at our doorstep. And I found that one of the biggest reason of that 1929 
you know depression was that the trust level was completely gone down between people between banks people were not transacting with each other all other crashes in market be it 2009 or 2000 y2k or even 1990s one of the common thing was like it is that time when difficult time from people to stop trusting each other however the example which you gave was not from the difficult time in the global or indian economy obviously yeah. that's a very, very sad example but me being a very positive and optimistic person i feel that environment to do business is getting better in india and it will do keep on doing better from here uh, maybe we have a slight difference in opinion here i don't know because you told about past what i'm talking about is i'm very hopeful about yeah, the future yeah i mean we have to be optimistic about the future yes, because, uh, yes. the future so what is I, what holds for yes, us and, yeah. and just because of that i have uh, got a team of people learners who have taken this course i made a team of them 10 people who are working closely on my payroll now and uh, we have started a project called economics of trust so the okay. trust difference which you explained what we are doing is we are you by using i mean i have used enough mathematical functions to quantify such things like you know uh, how basically we can find out that if the trust level goes high how we can show them that in monetary form also it will add benefits but i mean so, it's very difficult to tell you that okay if you trust me and i trust you it is a great thing to have but then you can immediately ask me great means how much great can you define it in the money term can by trusting each other we can generate 1000 of dollars in next true. one week right so i'm trying to come up with that kind of mathematical model mm -hmm. and for doing the data collection and i want to present this report to every indian and the government also i i will email them whether they read it or not we will work hard we will email them we will record it in a video like this and tell them that sir this is the high time you have to start trusting your businessman small one yes. or the big one big one yeah because even your source of revenue is the tax and it's the businessman who pay probably highest of the tax right so, yeah, so yeah. the trust level has to come up and come up at a great extent let's see i will take around a month to complete this project okay mm -hmm. and i would need help of my learners you and everyone else i'm yes, sure uh, good times uh, good times are ahead i mean not by like a political statement or something or i have nothing to do with the present government or the previous government i'm kind of a, a political person but what i understand that we have to have favorable business environment and for that everybody has to trust everybody else the trust yes. level have to have be high very very high in in terms of you know i mean this kind of negative feeling in the back that you know if i start business tomorrow and i can face this kind of problem if it stays in the common indian head yeah it will be really difficult time ahead so we need to probably come together speak to our government come up with good research and tell them by pointed manners that where we find the trust deficit to be the very high in which department probably and why yeah. only in the government and public even within companies employees are not trusting their employers employers are not trusting their employees that leads to nothing but micromanagement if you see i have seen i have worked in corporates and for 10 years my good times i would say and mm -hmm. i was lucky that i didn't have any of my boss who was i was always the youngest within all the team everywhere wow. where i worked i was always the youngest okay <laughs> so uh you still are young yeah i'm 35 i retired at 30 you can say so i was all, i i got a japanese boss his name is sagara masahiro such a gentleman he would come 2 hours before me and then he would send me home uh, and he'll go home after 2 hours so he would make me work 9 hours he'll work for 13 hours that kind of person so he would say you recently got married you recently had baby go home so i had that kind of bosses but what i have seen in different departments are most of the seniors or management people are doing nothing but doing micromanagement of the junior level employee so okay. they could be the best mind of the company but what they are doing actually is nothing but the micromanagement now is this going to add value even within the organization no obviously not yeah. they could have been into the production side revenue side generation side with their own individual effort 
so that individual contributor uh, people are even the top management can be but if you see most of the indian companies right now inefficiency lies within this micromanagement and distrust so we are working on this project some day we will mm -hmm. uh, we will uh, bring <clears throat> these uh, research reports I i'm trying to bring it into mathematical functions actually so that we can quantify that because of the trust loss how much money we are losing in numbers because theoretically talking these things don't make sense only when you yeah, show you, people they listen to absolute you. numbers absolute yeah, numbers. Absolute numbers 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 don't lie yeah 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 so uh, I'll, I'll, uh, i would look forward to receive the read the draft report and i'll see what best i can do to see uh, get you connected with the powers that be and sure. uh, we will see how we can move forward on that great sir great so guys uh, it's almost 2 hours now and we have thanking note i mean i am only one who can give the thanking note also to mr rajesh so many many thanks and i would read out some comment if people are going to comment here about this presentation so guys uh, any thanking note from your side to rajesh sir please comment i will read out on your behalf so shantanu is saying thank you mr rajesh uh, for our, for doing it Welcome. he also mentioned me okay thank you shantanu so guys we are concluding the session maybe a thanking note from your side would make a beautiful end to this great webinar so ram nevas is saying excellent work well i would like to recall the famous words of uh, my favorite music director a r rahman when he won the oscars right his, his thank you note was illa pogalum iraivanakke all the praises to god i have done nothing it is all no. god's it's the, the invisible director that is who has directed me to make this presentation so i take no credit for it it's great sir i mean i really loved both i remember the rajnikanth's one also it's a great learning for me also i'm a big fan of rajnikanth you can see my facebook page i have uh -huh. kept his photo on every birthday i would make uh -huh. his photo as my profile picture on every birthday his humility his everything is tremendous actually so many things to learn from mr rajnikanth so many things to learn work hard work humility matlab you you talk about the success, character success has not gone to their head that is the most exactly, important thing exactly so that the same thing that, that is the same thing with ar rahman too exactly. pretty down to earth pretty down exactly. to earth the, the kind of achievement that they have achieved in life and, right uh, and but to the humility that they display Uh, we are nowhere in comparison so i can't take any credit on my shoulders and say i have done a great job whatever i have done is by the invisible director who is directing me i'm just a um, small actor enacting my part in the role that's it right but i can tell you sir this video will be recorded on youtube and facebook and everywhere and i'm damn sure that people will come back relook at this presentation which you gave from your own industry from our learners fraternity who want to learn more about oil and gas and the technical aspect of it before reviewing oil and gas industry sector companies thank you very much sir thank, thank you, you all thank you uh, kundan for the opportunity it was a great pleasure to be presenting on your platform uh, much of a learning curve to me as well as i hope that people who have watched this have learned at least something of the oil and gas industry thank you sir thanks thank a lot you. thanks for accepting to come actually <laughs> the, the pleasure is all mine great great thank you. thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you everyone thanks for your precious 2 hours in the evening saturday evening enjoy your weekend we will meet again next saturday uh, i don't have the industry specialist name yet i'll meet someone on the weekday i'm damn sure because it's a 20000 plus learners community now and people from all sectors are there uh, bureaucrats recently few bureaucrats some police generals i mean police personnel army people so many businessmen have joined this course i'm sure i'll get someone even the next coming week who can come and present and share their experience of life business work or whatever you can call it it will be a learning for you again thank you we will meet again next saturday 5 pm thank you it's now becoming a ritual this is the third session i'm i'm loving it now you know i would have not seen this kind of uh, 
you know, a pure techie person coming on CNBC and talking about oil and gas industry. I, I would not see it anywhere else. I, I'm seeing myself. So I'm becoming fan of this program now. Okay. True. I accidentally True. launched it, but then I'm loving it now. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank brother. you. Thank you, sir.